Thank you once again. I'd like to take this opportunity now to um, really dedicate this one to all the students of AIM. The song I'm going to sing, it is in Siswati. And this is a song that was sung by a dove celebrating the harvesting time. I'm not really here, I'm just here virtually. I'm glad to have been invited to give this public lecture and I hope you forgive me for not coming all the way to see you for reasons that will soon be clear. I'm talking about the mathematics of planet Earth. So I'm a mathematician who has uh, been thinking about ecology recently and I'd like to tell you what mathematicians might do about that. We're in a very unique period of the Earth's history, as this chart shows. Uh, since the Ice Age ended around 9,000 years ago, the population of, the human population of the Earth was more or less flat until the first agricultural revolution, and then really with the second agricultural revolution, it shot up. So if to a first approximation, this graph looks horizontal up till around 1800 or so, and then vertical after that, this graph of the world's population. Obviously, this trend of population can't continue. Something's got to give. And so we're entering a moment of transition. And it's the transition between the time when humans can treat the Earth as essentially infinite and the time when we realize that there are actually limits to how much of various resources we can use from the Earth and how much area there is for human settlement. We are not at all prepared for this transition. Things have been changing so rapidly, we really haven't had much time to think about anything that's been going on. Uh, with the invention of the telephone, followed shortly by that of the automobile, by new drugs greatly extending people's lifespan and thus the population of the earth goes up. Invention of computers, clones, and so on. Everything is changing very rapidly, but we can still draw some general conclusions about what's going on uh, in this amazing era we live in. First is that all of our civilization is powered by consumable forms of energy, almost all of which is burning carbon at present. There's a bit of other forms of energy production that are coming into play, but it's mostly burning carbon. And it's been that way ever since about 1850, when people started burning first wood, and then coal, and then oil, and natural gas, at an accelerating rate. And it's this acceleration of burning of carbon that is responsible for a lot of our modern technology today, the ability to have this energy on tap, literally by plugging into the wall to power all the wonderful uh, tools and inventions we have. But the natural outcome of burning all that carbon is that we're putting a lot of carbon dioxide into the Earth's atmosphere. And this was measured by Keeling in a famous long-term experiment based in Hawaii and he saw that from 1960 to about now, the uh, concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere there has gone up quite a lot. It's gone up from about 310 parts per million, measured in volume, up to around 380. By now it's actually higher. By now it's, I believe, almost 390 or more. And before the Industrial Revolution, it was down around 280 or so. So it's increased significantly, uh, and there's a lot of evidence that that's due to us burning all the carbon 
It was in the form of uh, natural deposits. If you look, you can see something interesting here. There are annual variations in how much carbon dioxide there is in the air because most of the plants on Earth are in the northern hemisphere. So when they spring into action in the spring, they start sucking out carbon dioxide from the air uh, via photosynthesis, but then in the winter, it starts going back up. But those small variations, which are the effects of nature, are superimposed on this larger trend, which is really a human-caused trend at this period in our history. Now, carbon dioxide, as I'm sure you've heard, is a, is a uh, greenhouse gas. So that means that while sunlight can come freely down through the atmosphere, on a clear day at least, it can't all go back up in the form of infrared radiation. A lot of it gets stuck there, at least until the Earth gets hot enough to uh, emit an amount that makes things balance out. So the temperature of the Earth has to keep going up as the amount of greenhouse gases which trap the infrared radiation goes up. And here's a graph put out by NASA, the North American Space Agency. Uh, and you can see that it's, the temperature is very erratic on short time scales, on an annual scale, those black dots there. But if you average it out to a five year average, you get the red curve here, which is somewhat smoother. And you can see that that's going up considerably. It's been going up by about one degree Celsius since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and it's been getting steeper. Although some climate skeptics will emphasize this tiny little portion of the chart. Sometimes you'll see in newspapers just this little piece of the chart, and it will look like, well, maybe it's not going up that much. But that's an example of how, by taking a very small view of a big situation, you can get a uh, false impression of what's really going on. So the Earth is warming up, and one of the consequences of that is that the Arctic is melting. The amount of Arctic sea ice has been dropping much faster than expected, in fact, uh, in recent years. It's been going down since people have been keeping records, but ever since 2007 it's been going down faster. So it's about roughly about half as much of it there now as there was uh, around 1979 or 1980. Um, that's having effects, we believe, on the weather in the Northern Hemisphere. And there are a lot of weather implications of global warming that are the most important uh, in the short term. In the long run, uh, the, the uh, big ice masses like Greenland and Antarctica will melt, they're starting to melt, and that will raise sea levels. But in the shorter term, meaning 50 years or so, what we'll mainly notice is intense heat waves, uh, crop failures, and weather disasters, floods and droughts, more erratic weather because more energy in the Earth's uh, climate system. And we're already beginning to see that, I believe. It's very hard to attribute an individual storm to global warming, but people are doing a lot of interesting statistical analysis to try to test whether the average trend of the weather is, is uh, random or whether it's correlated to global, to the increase in carbon dioxide and to global warming, and those results are starting to come in now, and they'll continue to come in. The really important graph, I think, is this one. It shows the carbon dioxide concentration in the Earth's atmosphere, not just for a short period of time, like about 100 years, but for about 400,000 years. Most of this chart, the blue part, is the carbon dioxide concentration measured in ice dug up from a very deep core in Antarctica. And it shows that there's a correlation between the carbon dioxide concentration and the warmth of the Earth. So that when there's an ice age, uh, we see low carbon dioxide concentration. And in the intermediate periods between ice ages, we see a lot more carbon dioxide. In fact, there seems to be a kind of feedback loop where warming Earth creates more carbon dioxide in the air, and conversely, the easy part to understand 
is that more carbon dioxide in the air warms the earth. And so underlying small variations in the earth's orbital parameters called Milankovitch cycles seem to be able to be amplified to create these rather dramatic ice age cycles. Uh, and that's what we see here in the carbon dioxide graph. But the big news is that in the most recent periods where we measured the carbon dioxide concentration by other means, for example, by Keeling's experiment, the carbon dioxide concentration is shot up from around 280 or 290 all the way up to around 300, well, looks like 380 in this graph, but it keeps going up. This graph is a little, couple of years old. Gone up almost vertically. So on a geological time scale, the rate at which we're putting out carbon dioxide is, is immense so that this line is shot all the way above the previous uh, levels that we've seen between ice ages to some new regime that had only been seen long before. So in earlier epochs of the Earth's history, like the age of the dinosaurs, it was warmer than it is now, and there was also more carbon dioxide in the air. So you may say, well, well if it was so nice back then, what's wrong with it now? Uh, but the problem really is that the rate of increase in the carbon dioxide is so high now, and the ensuing rise in temperatures will become so rapid that species can't keep up with that change. Not just humans, but also other species will have to uh, adapt, move further north at quite rapid rates. In fact, we're seeing species move north in the northern hemispheres or move south in the southern hemisphere. Sorry, I had a little northern hemisphere bias there. Uh, and, and we're seeing that they're moving at rates that are comparable to what we think is the maximum they can move. So they're going to have trouble keeping up with climate change. And we expect to see quite a few extinctions in the years to come if we don't do anything very dramatically. And so again, this is all the result of the Industrial Revolution and our new method of generating power by burning carbon. And the only way that we know how to stop it is by either deliberately removing carbon dioxide from the air or not burning so much carbon or, or uh, deliberately cooling the earth, which won't actually stop the carbon dioxide concentration from going up, but will at least keep some of its effects from harming us. So. There's been a lot of work on what all this will mean to our world. And so one nice summary is this climate gamble prepared by MIT. The idea is you spin the spinner and it lands with different probabilities in different regions that say how much warming we should expect by 2100. If we don't do anything other than what we're doing now, if we just march along spewing carbon dioxide into the air, the gamble looks like that. We've got a little chance of getting three to four degrees Celsius warming, bigger chance of getting four to five, equally big chance to get five to six, a scarily high chance of getting six to seven, and even more than seven degrees Celsius. Climate scientists, a lot of them say that anything above two degrees Celsius is very dangerous. So when we start seeing big regions in the orange and red there, that really gives them nightmares. If we work as hard as we can to stop global warming right now, making serious changes in our energy patterns, energy usage patterns, the gamble looks more like this. We have a hefty chance of one or two degrees Celsius rise, which would be not so bad. Two to 2.5, very likely. 2.5 to three, fairly likely. Three to four, not so likely. So there's a big difference that we could make if we suddenly slammed on the brakes in our carbon emissions and changed our ways. Uh, I urge you to uh, download my slides, click on some of the pictures and links here for more details, then you can see what the uh, scenarios are here and what the assumptions are in these models that are used to generate this kind of prediction. But the short 
summary of it is stated quite nicely by Lonnie Thompson. He's a climate scientist who spent his life uh, digging up ice cores from tropical mountains, mountains that are actually uh, in the tropical regions of the earth, but so high that they have glaciers on them. And he's not by nature a climate activist, but he slowly noticed during his years of doing this that all of those glaciers were shrinking. And that added up with a lot of other evidence to convince him that something major is going on now. And so he puts it this way. He says, climatologists, like other scientists, tend to be a stolid group. We are not given to theatrical rantings about falling skies. Most of us are far more comfortable in our labs or gathering data in the field than we are giving interviews to journalists or speaking before congressional committees. Why then are climatologists speaking out about the dangers of global warming? The answer is that virtually all of us are now convinced that global warming poses a clear and present danger to civilization. So that's a strong way of putting it, but I think it's true. The more I study this subject, the more it seems evident to me that he's right. So now the question, this is a math conference and I'm a mathematician, so the question is what can mathematicians do? There are lots of different things that citizens as a whole can do and there are a lot of things that politicians could do if we voted into office the right politicians to do them. But in our role as mathematicians, what can we do about all of this? We could leave mathematics and go into climate science, or better yet, perhaps go into studying forms of uh, energy production that don't produce so much carbon. But suppose we want to stay mathematicians, because I know a lot of you do. What can we do then? So here are some answers to that. First, I want to list two easy, rather obvious things that mathematicians can do. The first one is to teach math as if the whole world depended on it, because it actually does. A lot of the problem with climate change is that the populace doesn't know enough uh, statistics and mathematics and have the basic scientific literacy to tell the difference between a valid argument and a fake argument. There's a lot of debate going on about climate change, and a lot of people who aren't uh, following very good scientific practice in their arguments. If we have a population of people who gets fooled by uh, any graph that they get, gets thrown at them, they're not going to be able to make responsible decisions about what to do about our planet's future. And the great thing about teaching math is that we've got a chance to uh, sh show the students how to take data and analyze it and uh, not fall for different kind of traps in logical reasoning. So there's logic, there's dealing with graphs, there's dealing with numbers, there are a lot of things like that that we can teach them. A second thing, very practical thing, is just to fly less. This mainly applies to successful uh, people, including successful mathematicians, who get invited to go places a lot. For example, I was invited to give a talk here, uh, and I said, no, I prefer to give the talk virtually, give it remotely. And by doing that, I saved one ton of carbon. I didn't burn a ton of carbon. That's a significant amount of savings because if you look at the world statistics, in 2010, the average person on Earth burned 1.5 tons per year in that year. So the amount burnt by rich, successful people is much more, but you can in that position have a huge impact uh, on your carbon footprint just by not taking one long airplane trip. The problem with academia is that success is often measured in terms of how many invitations you get to fly here and there. So it's almost as if you're being rewarded by being given carbon to burn. And we have to change those priorities. We have to develop new ways of having people meet each other and talk to each other that don't require such extravagant expenditures of energy. So this talk of here, this talk here of mine is an attempt to try to pioneer that. It's probably not as good as if I were there in person. I know I could do a better job if I could look you in the eyeballs. But on the other hand, I'm not burning a ton of carbon. So I hope that overall that's a good thing. 
flying around the whole earth telling people to burn less carbon. It's a hypocritical approach, so I didn't want to do that. There's also one very hard thing I'd like to talk about that mathematicians can do, maybe, and that's to invent the math we need for life on a finite-sized planet. So as I mentioned before, our general picture of technology is that the Earth is very large and hard to destroy, and so we can do more or less whatever we want, whatever we can figure out, and that human life is a small perturbation on the overall health of the planet. So we, can, we should keep on increasing our population as much as we can. We should keep the economy growing by burning as much carbon as we possibly can, to use as much electricity as we possibly can, to support as much technology as we possibly can. And that's a fine uh, philosophy for, as, for a certain while, but then it ultimately it's bound to run into a wall. It's bound to hit limits, because the Earth is unfortunately not a plane, it's spherical, so it's finite in size. Even if we expand in, into other uh, planets, the fastest we can go is the speed of light, so the volume we can, can control can only go at most as the cube of time, and so the whole economic dogma that we want constant exponential increase, that is exponential increase at a constant rate, certain percentage per year, is bound by the very laws of physics to hit a wall. And we're hitting that wall right now, and what that means is that we need a new attitude towards technology and towards science in which we treat humans as part of nature and nature as a bounded system, at least on each planet. So I claim that that's going to cause a big change in what mathematics is like. And that may seem strange if you've never thought about it, but if you think back to the Industrial Revolution, you'll realize that these major changes in our use of energy uh, go along with changes in mathematics. They are helped by math changes in mathematics, but they also cause change in mathematics. The fact that calculus was invented shortly before the Industrial Revolution is not a coincidence. Calculus and classical mechanics are the tools that allow us to predict the kind of systems that we build, the machines that we use in modern technology, predict what they'll do, and design them. And so the development in our ways of thinking go hand in hand with the development in our technology. But I want to take you back to an earlier revolution, the agricultural revolution, which is lesser known because it's older. Uh, and I want to tell you a little bit about how mathematics played an even bigger role in, in that bigger revolution. So this revolution started shortly after, shortly around the end of the, uh, around the, end of the last ice age, from 10,000 to 5,000 BC is how long the revolution took. And what did we do? We started systematically exploiting solar power. People don't often say it that way, but what we started doing is we started planting crops in large fields, sucking up the sun, turning it into uh, stored forms of energy, namely food, which could be used for humans or animals to power uh, the technology of the time. And by now, we've carried that program forward to the point where we're using one quarter of all the plant biomass grown worldwide. So one quarter of all the energy that comes down and turns into plant material on the Earth is being used by humans at this point. It's clear that that exponential growth can't continue. Once it reaches 100%, that would be the limit of that particular trick. And when it reaches 100%, there will be no nature in the sense of uh, a biosystem that's separate from humanity. We'll be in complete control of biomass. But let's go back to the beginning of the agricultural revolution. So shortly after the end of the last ice age, there is a sequence of events. First, people developed uh, the idea of farming, and for the first time they could 
have surplus food. You could grow grains and store them in silos and have a store of food for the first time. This allowed kingdoms to form because when you have an economic surplus, you get rulers who boss people around telling them what to do with this surplus and uh, distribute the surplus and collect taxes and things like that. Whereas in a hunter-gatherer society, that's just not really possible. It also led to slavery because for the first time, it made sense to boss somebody around and tell them to work all day for you, collecting grain to add to your stores. So slavery started at that time. Um, it led to the development of astronomical mathematics, that is, uh, detailed calendars and prediction of the sun and, and moon, because first of all, that's important for agricultural production. Second of all, it's important for social control. The ability of these rulers to do things like predict eclipses was a key part of uh, maintaining their, their, their rule in, in many of these old civilizations. It led to the development of geometry for measuring fields and measuring the volumes of storage containers. For example, when the Nile flooded in Egypt, it washed away the crop markers, and then they needed to use surveying and geometrical techniques to reestablish the fields, and they had to have records of the, of the measurements of the fields. And finally, it developed written numbers, numbers for commerce. Selling and buying things uses numbers. I want to talk about the development of how writing of numbers evolved, because it's pretty interesting. So starting around 8,000 BC, back in the Near East, we start seeing these little clay uh, shapes called tokens, and they were used for contracts. They're little geometric clay figures that represent different kinds of things, like sheep, or jars of oil, or certain amounts of grain. So if you made a contract with someone to buy a certain amount of one of those items, or to sell a certain amount of one of those items, you'd make that contract by making a certain number of these shapes, and, and they would represent the, uh, the deal. But eventually these tokens were sealed in clay envelopes so that you couldn't tamper with them uh, without busting the envelope and becoming visible. So if you wanted to change your mind about how much grain you promised to sell somebody, you couldn't do it anymore behind their back. The only way you could do it is by breaking the envelope, and that would be evident. So it's a kind of security system for these tokens. But of course, there's a problem with that. It's really annoying to have to break the envelope to see what's inside it. You don't want to be able to, you don't want to have to bust the thing every time you need to refresh your memory about these contracts. So they came up with a bright idea. They said that what we should do is to mark the outside of the envelope to say what's on the, in the inside. So they started marking them. And the way they did this at first was just take those clay tokens and press it into the soft clay of the envelopes to, to mark them. But then later on, they started drawing these marks separately on tablets. Once you have the idea of pressing into soft clay to leave a mark, you realize that you could get something like a, a stick or something and start marking clay tablets. And then eventually they just gave up on using the tokens altogether. I guess the security aspect became less important. The convenience of the clay tablets uh, overtook the uh, security of sealing things up in clay envelopes. And so they just marked things on tablets and that developed gradually into the Babylonian number system. So this transformation from the tokens to the numbers was complete by 3000 BC. So it took about 5,000 years for this process to, to happen. And at the end, we get the Babylonian number system that looks like this, which uh, is a base 60 number system with a strong base 10 uh, theme going on as well. You see numbers from 1 to 10, 11 to 20, 20 to 30, follow nice patterns that way. And, and this was the first uh, written number system. Now all of this may seem like child's play now. It seems very basic, this business of writing numbers. Of course, it's incredibly important. All of modern mathematics is based on the idea that we can write down 
calculations and refer to them so that they have some checkable, repeatable quality to them. But this 5,000 year process is what led to that and, it, and a key aspect of it was abstracting the concept of a general notation for numbers from the individual, from the individual uh, number systems that were used for different types of products. A token for a grain was different than a token for oil and in fact the number systems that evolved out of those different products were originally rather different to each other. Uh, there were at some point 12 different number systems used by different trade uh, organizations uh, and it was only later that that was abstracted out into a general purpose number system. So that abstraction is also fundamental to the math we know. Once this was in place, then they could speed ahead and start doing amazing things. By 1700 BC, they were able to compute square root using an iterative algorithm and they computed it to six decimals of accuracy. Of course, they didn't use decimals, they used base 60, but they came up with this approximation to the square root of two that's equivalent in accuracy to six decimal places. And if you're good at reading your Babylonian uh, numbers, you can see that they were computing the uh, diagonal of a square using the square root of two and using this approximation. Uh, this is a clay tablet in the collection uh, of Yale University. And then after that, you'll find that not that long later, they were doing things like solving cubic equations. You'll find homework, uh, math homework, among Babylonians where teachers were teaching their students how to divide by seven, which shows you that math teachers have always been sadists because base 60, it's really easy to divide by two and by three and by four, by five and by six, because those are all divisors of 60, but it's a real pain to divide by seven. So naturally that's what you've got in your homework. And they also see that uh, the students were doing it wrong too in some of the homework problems. So, so that's a transition from developing numbers to doing fairly sophisticated mathematics in response to a huge change in society that was in response to a change in energy production, essentially, the development of agriculture as a form of solar power or biofuels, you might say. So we're now undergoing a transition in the production of energy that's comparable in scale, and it's bound to lead to new developments in mathematics, and it's also bound to be helped along by new developments in mathematics. So the question is, what's that gonna be like? What kind of mathematics will we create when we realize that the planet is finite, and we no longer think of ourselves as separate from nature, when we realize that we're part of nature, not just a small perturbation on top of nature. So let's optimistically assume that civilization survives this process. This process is inevitable, I claim, because of the way we're running into certain limits, such as uh, global warming, such as the maximum amount of land that can be used for agriculture, and so on. So the transition will occur, but the nature of the transition is up for grabs, and it's possible that civilization will collapse. But let's assume it survives so that mathematics as a science continues. Then I think mathematics is bound to undergo a transformation, which may be just as big as in the agricultural revolution. So what is this transition going to be like? Well, there's really no way to know yet, but we can just daydream about it. And so as an exercise, let's just imagine one of the kind of problems that we're faced with now. So we're trying to deal with the problem of too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So let's just imagine the ideal machine for removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Let's not worry too much about whether it's practical. Let's just imagine what the ideal machine would be like. So it should turn carbon dioxide into some material that we can sequester or put somewhere. For example, buried underground. That would be nice. Unfortunately, that's probably going to take energy. Most reactions that do that take some energy. And of course, making that energy by burning fossil fuels would defeat the whole purpose of this device. So it can't be a machine 
that burns carbon or uses electricity made by burning carbon to do this job. So let's say that this machine is solar powered. That would be a lot better because then you wouldn't be burning carbon while you're trying to sequester or bury carbon. So we can imagine a machine like that, but the big problem is scaling up the operation fast enough. That is, making enough of these machines to do the job in time, because the climate problem has a clock associated to it. There's a limited amount of time we have to get the job done, or the Earth is gonna to get too hot. So the ideal solution would be if this machine were self-reproducing. If this machine could make more machines of the same kind, then you'd only need to make a few, and then they would just keep reproducing, and, and, uh, and maybe, since re reproduction can grow exponentially for a while, you'd get enough of them to solve the problem in time. So it should actually, it would actually be great if it took some of the carbon dioxide from the air and turned it into new machines, because it's supposed to be turning it into something anyway. Might as well turn it into new machines. And it would be even better, of course, if you didn't have to put these machines here and there. If they would just like spread on their own, maybe like through the air in the form of small computer programs that would then like assemble a new machine once they landed onto the soil somewhere. That then they could spread and we'd get enough of them in time, perhaps, to solve the problem. Well, this sounds like pretty fanciful, far out high technology, but I claim, luckily, that such machines already exist. And you've probably seen one. It's called a tree. So trees have all these properties. They, they convert carbon dioxide into material, some of which goes into the underground, some of which goes into the manufacture of new trees. They, they're solar powered and they spread on their own. And they're also even better, they're able to adapt to a wide variety of environments. So what does this mean? Well, for starters, of course, it means that if we could tweak trees, modify trees, so that they would sequester more carbon dioxide, or even if we could just stop cutting down so many of them, it could make a significant difference for global warming. If you download my slides and click on this sentence, you'll see that the United Nations has a program devoted to, to doing just this. By preventing deforestation and by starting up new forests, we might be able to handle about 20% of the carbon dioxide emissions problem. And they're trying to start doing that. But there's a big moral, bigger moral than just that. I claim that this idea of the tree is a simple example of what you might call eco-technology. That is, technology that works like nature and works with nature. If we develop ways of modifying trees, we can do uh, technological feats that if we started from scratch using primitive technology of the sort we are used to, uh, it, would, it would seem too difficult to do. So we could try to copy nature's working and also work along with nature instead of thinking of nature as something that has to be battled against. But we're really just at the beginning of developing eco-technology. For really sophisticated eco-technology, we need to do a lot of learning. First of all, we need to pay attention to lots of things that are already known. There's something called permaculture, which is an approach to agriculture which is sustainable. There's some branch of ecology called systems ecology, which is the study of ecosystems. And we need to learn about all those kind of things, or we could do things that backfire or just don't work. Uh, that's one thing. Another thing we do need to do, though, I claim is develop better mathematics, because we'd like to be able to model these kind of systems, and test them out in our models before doing anything drastic and potentially dangerous. And for that, I claim that we actually do need better math. So the, the ecologists Patton and Whitcomb said, to understand ecosystems ultimately will be to understand networks. Ecosystems are about many kinds of networks from the veins in a leaf to the, uh, to the formation of a tree to food webs where different kind of creatures eat other kind of creatures to river systems, like in my very first slide, and so on. And these networks all interact with each other in a very complicated way, but there are some general principles behind them which we're beginning to understand. 
So I've been working on networks. My own work on networks is rather abstract. It may seem like nice mathematics to you, but you might not see how it's connected to ecology. Here's a network, it's called a stochastic petri net. It shows how objects of different kinds turn into objects of other kinds by means of various transitions, which are these, which are these uh, yellow circles here. And it's a very general mathematical framework. It's actually related to a branch of math called category theory. You can prove nice theorems about it, and it's applicable both to chemical reactions, but also to uh, population biology and disease biology, where you might have patients infecting other patients and so on. And uh, that's, that's what I've been studying. It's, 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 it's the way mathematicians always do. They, they take ideas from specific contexts and generalize them and study them at a higher level of generality. But let me show you something a little more concrete, though, so you can see how, it's how, this, how math might be related to ecology more directly. So let's look at a leaf. A leaf is a kind of network. It's a transportation system for, for water through the uh, veins of the leaf. But is there math in a leaf? Can we actually do math by that's, that's about leaves? We're, we're good at doing math with things like crystals that are very regular and ordered. A leaf is organized in some way, but it seems irregular and complicated. And so it's scary as a mathematician to imagine trying to understand something like a leaf. Nonetheless, there's a mathematician at the University of California at Davis, Ching Lang Jia, who has written a paper about just that thing. It's called The Formation of a Tree Leaf. And you can click on my slide and get to that paper. And it's a really fascinating paper. I'll just sketch the idea of it. So he models a leaf as a bunch of square cells, a bunch of square regions, which are centered on grid points in a, in a square grid, together with veins, which are these line segments here, which form a graph. That is, they have edges and vertices, corners where the veins meet, that all go from the center of each cell, ultimately to the bottom of the, uh, of the leaf. And the idea is that he, he writes a uh, description where a leaf grows by continuing to add new cells at the boundary while minimizing a certain function. So here is a leaf that's growing. It doesn't look like it's growing. It looks like it's staying the same size, but it's really that we're drawing these little cells smaller and smaller. So it's actually, the leaf is growing. And, and each little cell has a some vein going through it, and the veins are optimizing something, maximizing, or sorry, minimizing something, the cost, uh, and thus producing this interesting pattern. This cost depends on two parameters. Basically, there's some cost for each length of vein. The longer the vein, the more it costs. And there's also a cost when two veins meet at, a, at almost right angles. So by adjusting the two parameters in this function that are due to those two effects, you get different shaped leaves. So for one value of the parameters, he gets a leaf that looks like this. For another value of the parameters, he gets a leaf like this. And they are fairly close to realistic tree leaves. Um, so, so something that seems beyond our comprehension and complexity, like a leaf, actually has a fairly simple model. It's not necessarily the final word on the subject, but it shows you the power of mathematics to study biological systems. So uh, it's, on the one hand, it's really clear if you read his paper that this guy's work is definitely mathematics. Here's a random page. It looks like a math paper full of Greek letters, estimates, uh, concepts from Desiree, and so on. But on the other hand, it's part of this theory of networks. It's not traditional mathematical physics. It's a different kind of math. For one thing, it's very important in his work to use computers to simulate the leaves to see whether his model is on the right track. He's dealing with systems that are too complicated to figure out using just pencil and paper calculations. So I claim that all of this new uh, mathematics for ecotechnology is going to require 
computer calculations. But on the other hand, it's not just a bunch of computer calculations. It uses all the tools of math that we have at our disposal. Analysis, combinatorics, in my case, category theory, and lots of other branches of mathematics. So don't get the wrong impression that it's just all going to be computers. Now. That's certainly not true. What's really important more than that is that this kind of new mathematics is drawing inspiration from different branches of science. It's drawing inspiration from biology, ecology, and sociology, the study of complex self-organizing systems, very much as the math of the Industrial Revolution was inspired by physics, physical systems that were much simpler to deal with than what we're talking about now. So this new kind of mathematics is just beginning to be born. So unfortunately, I can't show you a textbook of it and tell you, here is the key conjecture that you need to prove to, uh, to solve the, 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 to make the most progress in this subject. It's, it's nascent, fresh mathematics, just like when the Babylonians were first inventing numbers, they couldn't have told you what, uh, you know, here's Fermat's last theorem, this is what you need to work on. But I like working on brand new things, and I hope some of you do too. So I hope you can help out and figure out what the mathematics of the future will be. Thanks very much. Bye.